Jeff Moser joins us on the boardwalk on the hotline here on 97.3 ESPN. Jeff, how are you doing today? Hey, Josh. Hey, Hunter. Hope you guys are having a great day. Um, well, thank you. Good to be on with both of you. Well, I appreciate you jumping on. I think the top of the thing conversation is story that came out yesterday. We couldn't get to it yesterday, but today we want to get your input on Marquis Goodwin opts out. Now, we knew that he wasn't a short thing to make the roster because of his contract and the optionality it gave the Eagles there, but it's definitely a, a curveball, I think, that they could have done without. Well, certainly. I don't think it was a sure thing that Mark Goodwin would make the roster, but if you start doing the number count and project about six wide receivers on a 53-man, and you look at the overall group of wide receivers that the Eagles have, and when you start using more veteran, it begins and kind of ends with Deshaun Jackson for as long as Alshon Jeffrey is on PUP. So I do think there was a very good shot, given that they traded for him. He has the speed that they've been looking for, and that rookies in general, and especially this year, are going to be question marks. Don't know how quickly they're going to be able to adapt. Marquise Goodwin is a veteran. He has speed. He's never been a Pro Bowl receiver or even a possession receiver, but in the event that Deshaun Jackson were to get hurt or miss games, which he tends to do, you would have had Marquise Goodwin as that guy who could step into the Z spot, provide that same kind of vertical threat, even if you're not throwing the ball to him a lot. It's almost like that poor man's Torrey Smith role in 2017 where you're at least creating a vertical threat that safeties have to respect, and that help them, opens up the field for your tight ends and your interior passing game. So I think he would have made the team. Now, what happens is the pressure, as it has been for a while and continues to be, is on guys like Jalen Rager and then some of the rookies and other kids that they have, uh, like J.J. Arthigo Whiteside, to really develop and develop quickly. Do you think that this changes Doug's offensive game plan by any means, or is it more plug and play when it comes to that position that he would fill? Well, Hunter, that's a great question. I mean, I think Doug is smart enough to know that you, you go in with plan A, but you also need plan B and plan C. So for as long as Deshaun Jackson is healthy and able to play that Z spot and able to give this team that vertical dimension, he's going to want to get the ball down the field. Carson Wentz is going to want to push the ball down the field, and Doug is going to want to give him that ability to do so. Uh, if Deshaun were to get hurt, and then your real only explosive threats are these rookies and you know, we don't know exactly how acclimated they'll be able to get. Then, of course, I think Doug's going to have to go back to the drawing board and kind of take a page from out of last December when you lean a little bit more on the running game or throwing. I mean, he throws – the tight end is always a, a weapon in Doug's offense because he has two really good tight ends. They're always going to be there. But clearly you saw what Doug had to do last year with some plug-and-play wide receivers and relying a lot on those tight ends and Miles Sanders – to really move, and Boston Scott to move the chains both through the ground and the air. And that's something he would probably have to do if this wide receiver group is banged up or if Deshaun's banged up. And, and, you know, does he want to do it? No, but he's had to do it before. Does the Marquise Goodwin opt out mean anything short term or long term for the rookies, Quez Watkins and John Hightower? Well, it, it sort of does in that I think it opens up the door for them to get a roster spot now that he's not there. Again, I think Goodwin would have made the team unless he was just completely terrible in camp or unless all the rookies were just so good uh, that you, you couldn't find a spot for Goodwin. But I think he would have made the team. Now that he's not, you do the numbers. Again, you're keeping probably six receivers, maybe five, but probably six. You're starting with Deshaun Jackson one. Starting with Jalen Rager, too, and very, very likely he's going to have um, J.J. Arcega Whiteside at three. Greg Ward is probably your only slot receiver at four. So now you're looking at two more spots without Alshon Jeffrey being active. And certainly the two guys who are going to come to mind first are, Quez, are John Hightower and Quez Watkins. Now, I, I think that there's room here, and it wouldn't surprise me in light of Marquise Goodwin opting out if Howie doesn't go out there and look for a veteran wide receiver. There are some names out there. Uh, you know, Taylor Gabriel is a guy who has some quickness and has played in the Bears offense, so he, he knows the Eagles offense. It wouldn't surprise me if between now and 
maybe the start of the real practices or even sooner than that, that how he decided to, you know, bring in a guy like that on a one year veteran deal. How concerned, how concerned should these teams be seeing all of the players opting out around the league? Or I guess really it's how concerned should the league be? Well, fairly, it's, it's, I think it varies, you know, I mean, uh, certainly Marquise Goodwin opting out hurts the Eagles. Um, is it debilitating? No. You look at the uh, New England Patriots. They had several players opt out, including Dante Hightower. So it's going to impact them more so than a team that has maybe one or two players who are fringe players opting out. The New York Giants, I believe, just were informed today that Nate Solder is opting out. And that's an interesting one because you can say, man, that's a, that's a tough loss because he's a starting offensive lineman, but he hasn't been a very good offensive lineman for the Giants. But nonetheless, you don't want to lose offensive linemen uh, as the Eagles know, this early in camp, you know, no matter what uh, caliber they are, because offensive line play is not very good in general in the NFL. So if you have one that can at least compete and play for you, and you don't want to have to lose them to an opt-out, uh, although you obviously respect the decision, I'm just saying that that hurts a team like the Giants, who are already in the midst of a lot of head coaching and scheme change. Jeff Mosher joining us here on the Boardwalk on the Hotline on 97.3 ESPN. Make sure you follow me on Twitter at Jeff Mosher NFL inside the birds podcast, as well as inside the birds.com here on football at four and 97.3 ESPN. Uh, the other interesting news today with the wide receivers, Jeff was Jason Avant. He is apparently going to be part of camp and as a coach for the wide receiver. So what are your thoughts on Avant and his knowledge of the game being brought into the Eagles facility for the receivers? Yeah, I think it's it's a great resource to have. Um, they've brought back former players before, or I believe it's the Bill Walsh Diversity uh, Internship Program. Um, it's always good to see guys who are good at their position come back and spread their knowledge. Jason has been local. Um, we've had him on, the, on our Inside the Birds live shows before, and he's really good at explaining scheme, at explaining routes, at explain, at teaching the game. You know, Jason Avant is known for being a slot receiver who probably had the best set of hands on a team, on an offense that included Jeremy Macklin, Brent Selleck, and Deshaun Jackson, and was setting records uh, in the late, you know, 2006, 2007, 2008 for points um, when they had Donovan and then on to Michael Vick. So he had a great set of hands. I don't know if that's something that's teachable to guys like, Rager and Hightower and Watkins. I mean, I think some of that is just how, how not just God given, but how hard he worked at his craft and knowing that he was not an elite speed outside receiver, that was going to be how he makes his money. So I'm sure he can give some guys some, you know, tips, techniques on things that he did to have a great set of hands. But I don't know if that's kind of a, an osmosis thing where all of a sudden guys who have struggled with drops are going to learn how to better secure the ball because they're getting coached by Jason Avant. But certainly Avant's knowledge and uh, his ability to you know, teach guys on how he stacked cornerbacks and work defenders on the inside can certainly help. Well, it looks like we have a little bit of breaking news as Mike Garofolo is tweeting out that Eagles right tackle Lane Johnson has been placed on the COVID-19 list which means he either tested positive or is in quarantine after close contact with somebody else who tested positive. So now you're seeing the Eagles have to work around this situation and make sure whoever was around Lane Johnson is okay. And you think about the offensive line as a whole, is it going to spread to offensive line? I mean, now you have the Eagles dealing with this in-house. Yeah, well, uh, I'm telling you, uh, I don't know how Lane got it, so I'm not going to jump to any conclusions, but I am going to be very firm on something I said about a week or two ago that I think fairly applies, and that's Lane Johnson uh, and Duke Manyweather put together this offensive line sub- summit down in uh, the Dallas area, I think two weekends ago, and there were about 50 offensive linemen there, and um, you know they said they were going to be precaution, but it was indoors at a hotel in Plano, Texas, or Frisco, one of those uh, uh, towns north of uh, Dallas that's suburban. Um, there were a lot of offensive linemen there. At first, when I saw videos come out, it looked like there were a decent amount of safety precautions taken. But as the days went by, I noticed that there were guys there not wearing masks. They were all, you know, obviously a lot of them were traveling in from certain areas. And uh, there was like a wing eating contest, I believe, where I read about that guys were shoulder to shoulder. 
And uh, I, as, as I said at the time, even if you're taking precautions, which I don't know if they took enough, but even if you are, you are doing this at a time in which your your players association doctor is telling people in the of their players not to do workouts, not to combine, not to get together, to stay separate a week or two before camp, not only for health and safety measures, but because they're fighting tooth and nail with owners on enhanced health and safety protocols. And it looks very hypocritical for the players association to be fighting for these things and demanding X, Y, and Z from NFL owners when their own players are already doing things that the NFL PA is urging them not to do. So Lane coming down with COVID, I don't know if it's from that, that offensive line summit that he had, but certainly it leaves him open to criticism for doing that at the, you know, at the, um, opposite word from his own players association. Now on the other side of this, my question for you, Jeff is doesn't this validate the whole setup of testing these guys and not letting them in the building with everybody else before they've cleared the COVID test. Cause we've seen how that worked with the NBA and the NHL. They had a cluster of tests at the very beginning. And then as the weeks went on, they cleared the virus out of everybody's arenas and buildings and systems so that everybody could play. So isn't this also kind of a good thing that they caught somebody with it like Lane Johnson before he mingled with the rest of the team? I mean, yes, Josh. I mean, that is a, uh, a truth. But I would say at this stage of the game, if they weren't doing that, they would be negligent. I mean, should we be congratulating the, the league, the players, the owners for – testing in advance when it's pretty obvious that that's what you needed to do before you got everybody inside your facilities anyway. Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm a, but to me, that's, that's a no brainer. Well, it looks like the Philadelphia Eagles just put out a statement. Nate Gary also on the list and Jordan Maialata. So you are starting to see a little bit more of a snowball effect with this team. I mean, that's the starting linebacker right at this point and another offensive lineman. Yep. Yeah, and an important Nate, you know, Jordan Mailata, who's had different health issues in the past. This is supposed to be a very, very big camp for him, and this time is not going to be good. So you have to hope that, well, first of all, the format, as Josh was just alluding to, works in the favor, right? Because they're not really going to be doing a whole lot of team activity stuff for another two, two and a half weeks. It's, it's strength training now until they really get into the heart of it. So, what you have to hope is that in cases like Lane and Jordan and Nay Gary, that these are more of the, and I don't know, I haven't seen you guys are reading it to me. I don't know if they're asymptomatic. I don't know if they knew about it or not. You just have to hope. Well, this yeah, a, it, just to be clip. clear, it says here they either tested positive or they have been in close contact with an infected person. So you don't really know if they right. actually have it or not. Correct. So ho- hopefully for the Eagles and their sake, it's a quick fix. It's a short thing. They get healthy and they're fine or they, you know, they pass enough tests in a quick manner and can continue strength training. And you hope it's not like a Freddie Freeman situation in baseball or, or, you know, others who have been stricken and, and, you know, gotten sick and really have some stories to tell about it. Jeff, a question we had earlier specifically about the, the COVID issue is also that, you know, with Marquis going opting out today, we saw, a guy like Nick Markakis opting back in to play baseball. And that was part of their agreement. So is there a possibility of NFL players, once they opted out, to also opt back in to your knowledge? Josh, I'll look into that, but I was under the impression that if you opt out, you opt out for good. I don't think in the NFL you can opt in, you know, X X amount of days into the season after you take the – the opt out stipend, right? So I'll look into it next time we, we speak. I'll have a clearer answer on that. But I was pretty much under the impression that it's a one time decision only. Yeah, because I, I want to get your insight is because I know you're also the co host of the Powder Blue podcast. Because for a player to opt back in, doesn't that feel. I have mixed feelings about that because if, if a guy like Marquise Goodwin, I mean, he's obviously opting out for a very specific reason. And now you see three Eagle players you know, fall into the COVID list if someone did opt out. I just don't know how a guy could get up to speed football-wise to opt back anyway. I feel like baseball and football are just two extremely different sports in that matter. Yeah, you're, 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 you're 
on the right track with that. I think I think that's fair. I mean, it's been done. Guys have started the season hurt, like Alshon Jeffrey's about to do, and um, been able to play by week five or six, and they had to catch up. So it can be done, but I think the NFL is trying to present this almost like revolving door scenario where guys are in and out and out. In. And so they pretty much gave a, an extended deadline, not an extended deadline, but you know, the deadline I believe is August 7th, which is a decent amount of days from now to be able to decide on whether you're committed or you're not committed. Most, I'm not going to lie to you. This is the worst I've ever felt about the NFL. I just, I don't see this going well. And does it seem like the NFL is just assuming that, when it comes ready that they'll be able to make this work. I just, I don't know if they're doing enough for my liking when this is happening and you're seeing all of these players opt out. Well, I feel like from a legislative standpoint, Hunter, I mean, they've had their talks, they've gone through pages upon pages of health and safety protocols that people must follow. And now it's up to human behavior. You know, if everybody does what they're supposed to do, then this shouldn't be an issue. Even, you know, I wouldn't be discouraged about people being on the COVID list now because you've got six weeks, if not more, before an actual game has to be played. Um, I would, though, be concerned about the idea of is someone going to break protocol and maybe that's what happened with the Marlins. It sure sounds like from reports that that's what happens, right? And, and then infect a team and another team because of it. So I, I understand your concern. I think it's too early to draw conclusions. I think I do think the safeguards are in place, as we just talked about. These, these guys are on the list. I mean, they've got some time to test um, negative, and then uh, I'm sorry, test. <laughs> I always mess this up. They test negative. I was right the first time. You want them to be testing negative for COVID, correct? Right. Yeah. Yes. Um, yes, that is so, correct. Yeah, hopefully, there's time to get them <laughs> right. Hopefully, there's enough time for these guys to get negative tests, and then go into, uh, you know, uh, training and join their teammates and get ready. And we'll just see if everybody can follow the protocols. I, I think, the, to your point, though, the NFL, I don't think they're blind to the fact that there might be COVID-related issues as the season goes on. I just think that they want that product on TV. They want that TV money. And if it means that, you know, on uh, Monday night there's a game between two interesting teams and yet, Half, you know, one third of the team is, is backups and the other one, then the NFL is going to say, hey, that's our product. That's, that's, that's the, what we're trying to do. So um, as long as they can feel the team and, and, you know, the extended practice squads are going to help in that regard, then I think they're, they're, their viewpoint is let's go full steam ahead. Jeff Mosher joining us here on the Boardwalk on the Hotline on 97.3 ESPN Football and Ford, powered by the Inside the Birds podcast. Also, InsideTheBirds.com. And speaking of Inside the Birds, Jeff, I got to ask you about at Inside the Birds on Twitter. You guys tweeted out this question that I, you put this out there, and if you know I, if you know me, you know I saw it, and you know I had to ask you about mm-hmm. it. <laughs> Cut, tag, extend a new variant of a different game. First of all, I want to know why you chose the other two quarterbacks because your cut, tag, extend designation for each quarterback is. Carson Wentz, Deshaun Watson, mm-hmm. and Dak Prescott. I'm curious why it was those two you guys specifically picked for this question. Well, it's, 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 it makes it more complex because one's already been extended. One is on the franchise tag and having, you know, uh, you know kind of a contract discussion. And the other one could face that by the end of this year. So, um, it, it puts all three. It, it's not like you took three players who are extended, three players who are on the franchise tag. You know, you kind of add these extra variables into it, and you know, you just get the reaction. And they're all three very talented quarterbacks who, in, in quite honestly, have won nothing. Right? I mean, none of them have won anything of substantial. I mean, Carson's played two minutes of a playoff game. Uh, Deshaun Watson has won one playoff game, I believe, if I'm correct, against the Bills. Right? That was just. This, this last year was his first playoff win. Dak Prescott, yeah, and Watson too. No, they no, both, uh, they not, both did. No, well, yeah, yeah, and and Dak's won, I believe, what one or two playoff games, but nothing of you know nothing. So right. he hasn't been very far into the postseason. So right. they're kind of all of that same caliber. And when people do their rankings, they kind of have those guys all around the same group. So we thought it would be an interesting uh, question. 
It's definitely interesting. I think it's a hot debate around this city all the time when it comes to Carson and Dak specifically. Now, I just want to throw this out there. Lane Johnson did put out a statement, and he did say that he he tested positive but feels strong and ready to go. So it is confirmed that he actually specifically did test positive. Well, there you have it. <laughs> so I go back to what I said about him at the offensive line on Sunday. I mean, it, it certainly left him – open to any criticism that he might receive uh, if indeed. And I, and I said this, even if he may not have gotten it there, I'm, I'm not making, well, he I'm said he tested, he, saying, he, he continued and said he tested negative mm-hmm. after the travels, including before and after going to that offensive line stuff. Mm. So okay. he's well, putting out know, his again, timeline. Well, yeah. There's a lot of, uh, yeah, there's a lot of unknown about how, I don't know if he tested like a day after he came back or how long. Who knows? But either way, I'm sure. Did he? Does it say if he's any symptom? He said he feels good. I think that's that's the important part, and hopefully it stays that way, and he's back with the team uh, in a short time. And that, and that gets to me. What's important about the testing, Jeff? And that is, you know, for all the people who, you know, oh, why do you have to test so much? You got to test so much because one day someone doesn't test positive, and another day they do because. We're finding that so many people now who are asymptomatic are carrying mm-hmm. this COVID. So to me, I think this is one of the important reasons why the players fought with the league about we want testing every day until the numbers come down because we want to make sure that someone isn't showing up. Oh, like baseball, uh, one day tested right. negative, one day tested positive. You can't have that, especially when people are banging into each other a few seconds. Yeah, that is a fair point, and I think it, is a, it was a good win for the players to get uh, daily testing. And I know that that's supposed to recede right? eventually in a few weeks to where it's not every day. But you know, they may want to kind of revisit that and say for at least uh, you know three more weeks, we're going to test every single day and, and and keep it that way in light of what we've seen with baseball. Yeah, because one of the problem with baseball is they, except for the Phillies right now, they're not testing every day as a regular procedure. They're testing every 24 to 48 hours, depending on when the last results of the last test came in. Whereas the NBA, the NHL, the MLS, they're testing every day no matter what. Right, and it's really, it's interesting as we kind of, I, I feel like the bubble teams are, are obviously, they're doing a good job. Right? I think the NBA and the NHL both, both said they have zero tests up in their latest round of testing that nobody has uh, tested positive. So that's a good thing. However, I, I don't think that that just means that any outdoor sport, the way you know NFL is going on or non-bubble sport is destined and doomed to follow in the footsteps of Major League Baseball. I, I know golf is different and NASCAR is different, but you do have a non-bubble environment where your athletes going from place to place and traveling um, and, and, you know, doing their thing. And those two leagues have been able to, uh, I guess, yeah, leagues, PGA, if you consider it that way, um, have been able to do their thing with, with very minimal losses to COVID. So I would say that just because baseball and football kind of have a similar format going on doesn't mean that the NFL is doomed to follow in baseball's footsteps. He's Jeff Mosher, co-host of the Inside the Birds podcast. Again, go check out the Inside the Birds at Inside Birds Twitter because I I love this question you guys put up. I encourage everybody to go check it out at Inside Birds. The cut tag or extend between Wentz, Watson, Prescott. I'm sure you and Adam will be talking about in the next edition of the Inside the Birds podcast. Everything that's going on with the Eagles drops again tomorrow morning. Correct? Yeah, that is correct. Six a.m. Thursday morning. Going to have some stuff on. Uh, you know, the Eagles still have one more player to cut as far as for roster size. Um, We'll talk about this in COVID here, and then we'll get into uh, some of the other areas that we still think the Eagles may need to address and shore up before the start of the season. Inside the Birds podcast, go check it out. Drops tomorrow morning, but you can still you know hit that you know subscribe button today so you get the alert when it drops tomorrow. So you don't have to wait. You can go do it now. Jeff That's Mosher, right. co-host of the Inside the Birds podcast. Jeff, appreciate all the insight. All right, fellas. Talk to you again soon.